Hey, good morning. Welcome to the um, Service Improvement and Finance Scrutiny Panel. Um, because this is the first meeting of the new municipal year, we just need to uh, agree a convener. So Councillor Holly's offered to stay on as convener for the um, following year, unless there are any, any other interest. If I could just get um, the panel to raise their hands to agree, Councillor Holly. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your confidence in that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Apologies for absence. It's the first item on uh, the agenda. We've had an apology from Councillor Bridget Rollins. OK. Uh, any other apologies? No. Uh, and we have had an apology this morning, uh, yesterday, for Councillor and Andrew Stevens, uh, who was unfortunately can't make it uh, because of whatever. Um, but that is unfortunate as he's the cabinet member. Uh, item three is disclosure of personal and prejudicial interest. I think most people have got interest in roads. But apart from that, there is no other, I wouldn't have thought. The minutes of the previous meeting, I'm sure you've all read them and uh, agreed them. All OK? Yeah. OK, thank you. Right, any public questions? No. Right, we go on to the substantive report, which is the road repairs. And uh, can I welcome Mr. Bob Fenwick, who is the um, group leader, Highways Maintenance. And we're told that uh, Mr. Stuart Davis will be here as well. Oh, he's online. Yes, oh, thank Stuart. you. Thank you, Chair. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, who, is, who is the head of Highways and Transportation. Uh, who's starting? Are you Bob or are you Stuart? I'll I'll let Bob uh, uh, guide us through. That's that's fine. Absolutely fine. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. All to you then, Bob. That one. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, thank you. Um, okay. can imagine. Um, OK, going through the report then. The highway asset is probably the biggest asset the council set on, although sometimes it's um, debatable whether it's an asset or a um, liability. Yeah, well, in accounting terms, um, we have around 1,100 kilometres of carriageway and around 600 kilometres of footway. Um, current calculated backlog on the road network for carriageways alone is around 70 million. Um, this is calculated on a, um, a mechanism that's been agreed across Wales by um, an asset management project that's been running for some years. It relies on stat statistical data taken from physical measurements, unit costs, and then the length of the network in, in the various conditions. So it's, a, it's a, a very much a calculated figure rather than a, an assessment or judgment. Um, we calculate we calculate the steady state backlog um, is around seven to eight million. Again, this is a a calculation based on um, scanner data that we, tells us the condition of A's, B's, C's, and unclassified roads. Multiply that by cost deterioration modelling. Um, we do a report every year that actually shows how this works. This isn't down to necessarily not doing work, but it could also be to the increase of unit costs for materials. The obviously costs recently have gone up quite a lot, so the backlog figure will rise and fall in relation to that. We only tend to calculate every few years because it's quite a piece of work to do. Um, why we do it? We manage the highway because it's a statutory obligation. Um, Highways Act 1980 basically means we have to keep the highway safe and passable to all. Um, we have policies in place to sort of outline how we do this. In terms of repairs, um, you can split it into routine repairs and plan maintenance repairs. Now, the difference here is routine is to keep it going, keep it safe, to deal with issues as they arise, uh, whereas plan maintenance is the long term condition of the network, looking at um, the overall network condition, the, 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 the general um, condition of the network. And that includes the larger recycling and uh, larger uh, surfacing schemes and the patch program. 
I, we, we, we're trying to move away from calling it the patch program because it causes confusion between routine repairs and plan maintenance repairs but we haven't really got a name that's stuck that says what it is and everybody knows what patch is so it's quite a difficult to move away from um repair routine repairs there's quite clear guidance on this um we are required to meet a certain standard by the courts um we get in the region of probably seven eight thousand reports a year of potholes um defects flood flooding drains etc these all go through a system statutory obligation for these is to repair anything that meets our intervention level now this level again has been agreed across wales um some of the english authorities have also agreed our standards because it's the only set standard that's been agreed by a big group of people um it's been assessed by engineers we're looking at the the availability and the ability to calculate and to repair defects as well as um the liability through insurance and through the courts now our our insurance defense and our ability to make statutory repair is very very good we're one of the best in the country and we have been for a long period of time at defending claims it's because we focus on those that are a statutory obligation now this is our core work with our inspectors and our um tarmac gangs they look at these safety repairs now on top of that We've got the pothole repair pledge that you'll hopefully all know about. This is about reporting things that have re reported to us by the public that wouldn't necessarily or normally be repaired. Um, the old methods repair a pothole or report a pothole, and the inspector would go and check it to see if it breached our statutory obligations. If it did, we'd repair it. If it didn't, nothing would happen. So the, the pothole pledge is to repair those things that are not a breach of standard. It's supposed to focus on individual issues. Um, I can give an example where we've got a very discontented member of the public who's reported uh, Fenrod Way something like 160 times in one weekend, um, reporting each individual pothole to try and get us through the system. Now, obviously, I can't resurface a road with two men and a couple of buckets of pothole material. Um, it has to go through a formal process. It has to go through um, the resurfacing program to be assessed to see where it fits. There's been a massive problem with this over the winter. Swansea suffers from um, marginal temperatures, we mean, which means we get fluctuation between plus one, minus one. That can be really damaging on a wet road. Um, if we had colder temperatures and we had freezing temperatures that lasted for longer, the road freezes and it thaws eventually. We get a freeze thaw cycle. It can be evidenced by deterioration of the Mumbles Road by um, Black Pill this year. In one week, it went from nothing to missing the top layer now again for the top layer for us this isn't dangerous this isn't a statutory um, obligation to fill but obviously it's a major issue for the public um it's uncomfortable the ride ride quality is not great motorcyclists are uncomfortable on it as well so we've we try and sort of look at how we build in repairs to these sort of reputational issues and we've got an extra program going at the moment that's nearly caught up with most of the damage from the, the winter in terms of the surface defects but it's it's just to um, what I'm trying to do is explain the difference between we have statutory, we have public for single defects, we have reputation work, and then we have assessed planned maintenance work, which involves the larger schemes. Yeah. What? Well, sorry. Do you want to ask a question now, Jeff, as we go through, or do you want to leave Bob go until the end? No, I, I let him go to the end. Yeah. Okay, very well, yeah. thank you. It's only on something he's covered. Okay, on. thank you, Bob. Yeah, and I'm happy either way. Um, if we if we go into then sort of reputational work, we look at the stuff that's been reported the most by the public, those that are trying to really get our attention and they're complaining that we haven't had service. I've reported this these potholes a dozen times and nothing's been done. Well, actually, what we'll, we will do is we'll visit with a pothole team. We'll repair the worst of it, anything that breaches statutory levels. If there's anything that looks nasty or that's in the wheel track, for instance, we will try and repair. And then it will be put onto a program for another piece of plant, our jet patcher, which is very, very good at doing surface level repairs. Unfortunately, we've got about 100, 100 odd jobs in the queue for that at the moment. It can't work in the wet because of the nature of the work. Um, so there's a bit of a hold back on that. But these aren't these are not safety defects. These are the sort that cause yourselves a councillor is probably the most problem um this is stuff that the public see the large area and they wonder why we're not doing anything 
if we go through then to the plan maintenance program, um, we follow best practice on it. In fact, some of our long term practices have been adopted by the asset management project as as good practice. The fact that we publish a five year program, we told people in advance what we do. We do an assessment of the network every five years to look at the worst roads. We have a, a scoring system that is not based on um, political ward. It is based purely on engineering judgment, condition, accidents, the frequency of buses, um, whether a road is a single road in and out of a community, um, neighbor, vicinity to schools or hospitals. All of these things will score points on us on, on a system and it gives us the road overall score. Obviously, the classification of the road, A's, B's, C's, and the number of um, vehicles per day scores as well. That gives us a list, and we've currently got, out of the 6,000 odd roads we've got in Swansea, around 2,000 are currently on our list as being assessed as needing work sometime in the future. These get scored, and it gives us a, a very good mechanism for letting people know where they stand in the system. If if once a score is in place, we've got a costing for most of these jobs. And we could tell you if the road you're reporting is 100 down the list, there might be 2 million quids worth of work ahead of it. But it gives people a very clear identification. It's not us being picking and choosing favours for where we go. It is pure engineering and um, variable assessment. We have had to abandon that a little bit this year and focus more on condition because of the damage the winter's done. So there have been roads that we wouldn't normally do that have been raised because of condition and surface um, surface level defects. So stuff that's not statutory, but really does need to be done. There's particularly fair bit in France Hamlet that we've had to look at. Um, so that's how we that's how we score things. For plan maintenance as well, we've got to try and manage the budget as best we can. We've got a massive backlog. We've got to make the buck stretch as far as possible. And good practice says that it is better to do preventative work. It's much cheaper. And it, it gives an extended lifespan to an existing road. Overall, this is a much, much more efficient way of doing it. And we have modeling tools we can use to show that, that the actual condition of the network as a whole will be better off the more preventative works you do. But it's a different difficult then between what's preventative. So if I go into your ward and I fix one street that's in a reasonably reasonable condition, because it's a preventative treatment and see, people wonder then why am I not doing the next street over which is far worse it's because they're different treatments the treatment for preventative works is about a third the price of the, the full-on scheme and it will give me six seven eight nine ten years of additional life um, and that will be the same lifespan as a resurfacing scheme um, in theory you should get sort of 10 years out of a the the, the, the materials we use at the moment before they start to show wear and tear so you can see why we want to do preventative, but obviously it is difficult and there is that balance between public demand, my road's bad and what is sensible for the network. I've explained to the cabinet member recently that if I had the money, the road I would do at the moment would be the Fabian Way. Now, we've only had a couple of potholes on it. We did it around five years ago, but if I could seal that now at a cost of maybe 200 grand, that gets me another six, seven years before it starts falling apart. But at the moment, there is no issues with it. No one's reporting it. And if we went out and did that, it would, there'd be lots of questions. Why are you doing this road, not the others? So it's a balancing game for us. And this is this is the whole theme of my report. It's a balance between safety, public perception, the money we've got, cost effectiveness. Some of the treatments we use for preventative measures aren't very popular. They can make a bit of a mess, but they are very, very durable and very, very good value for money on the roads. Um, I will get, say, four schemes to the price of one for the preventative works. Um, so we're trying to balance it all out all the way through. We do listen to people. If you're, for instance, if a councillor reports a scheme, there is a variable in our scoring system that says a number of people of the public have reported this. The councillor has reported this. It's been raised politically through formal channels and each one gets a couple of points. And we give that the same sort of score value as we do when our man maintenance managers report on a road that's given them problems. So it is worth reporting them, obviously. You won't be able to report all the roads in your ward as being the worst because we will notice that and then we will ask you which ones you know your top priority because you know they would be very easy to manipulate the system then um we are looking at the system we've got the scoring system because at the moment we feel it gives a little bit too much onus on the main fast roads 
and not quite enough to the residential streets. So if you're living in a cul-de-sac, even if your road's in really poor condition, it, it's going to take a while to climb up the scoring system. Um, so we are looking at a balance, but we've been using this for maybe eight, nine years now, and we've actually sent copies of our system to other councils to show them what we've done. We borrowed the original, original scoring template from Leithport Talbot from their bridge team. So we're not, uh, you know, against looking at good practice and seeing how other people work. But we feel this works very well and it also gives us very arbitrary um, defence against what we're doing. And it stops political pressure on the engineers because we have a score. Um, what else have we got? I don't think I can go into any more detail. Asset management wise, again, we're signed up to the, um, the CCS Wales Asset Management Project. I've been, I sat on the board for about six or seven years. Um, yeah. So we've done a lot of work in terms of mutual cooperation, looking at how things work. We share contracts with people where we can. Um, we've got a very good arrangement with our contractor who wins, who has won uh, through a, a tendered process, obviously, but they've been working for us for about 12 to 13 years. They regard us as a core, their core council. Um, so they put lower bids in for us. Um, I'm not talking about Alan Griffiths, I'm talking about Hanson Contracting here um, as a resurfacing company. But it means that we've got that relationship that if their products fail, we've had them go back. I think Town Hill Road was an example. They relayed a road that cost them something like £60,000 because the material failed for three, four years afterwards. But because we've got that good relationship with them, it doesn't go to court. It doesn't go to um, adjudication. Um, and they like they regard us as their sort of prime contact in South Wales. Um, future challenges. Climate is a huge one for us, particularly if we get more of these marginal winters. Um, climate change says everything's going to be getting warmer, but we're also going to be getting more winter, um, really poor weather in the winter. The, this year, I've not seen anything like it in terms of road deterioration. We we had to salt the roads something like 40 odd times, which is the most we've ever done. Now, people won't see it as a particularly cold winter because there was no snow, there was no, but for us, it was positive minus, positive minus, positive minus. Then with the water, we've had to resalt the roads where the water's washed off the salt. All of that gets in and damages the roads. It's all, uh, particularly where your roads are in average to poor condition, the water will get in, it'll break them up. The surface materials we use at the moment are particularly susceptible to winter. Um, they're known as like what's a, a, a negative texture. So the way that the grip is formed on the road is through voids rather than the old days when you used to see asphalt carpet being laid in a chipping machine roll over the top of it that was a solid layer with chips coming out that gave you the grip what we've got now is a whole a road with voids and this is something we are seeing deterioration this is where you see um, by black pill you see small 40 mil defects and i'll tell you the 40 mil because the top layer of the surface of the road is 40 mil deep and you see a flat layer underneath again we've defended these in court and we can do that all day but it doesn't help. We have to look at materials. We're trying new materials that are more dense, less voids, but the problem then becomes surface friction and um, tire grip. So there's lots of scientific stuff going on. We're looking at um, carbon emissions from uh, resurfacing. We're looking at a, what's called warm mixed tarmac, which is made at a lower temperature than the traditional stuff. More expensive, but it gives us more workability, which means it's easier to lay, but also carbon emissions come down like something like 30, 40%, although there isn't a, an agreed method of calculating that at the moment. But it's certainly something we're looking at. We're looking at Welsh Government have got a new um, road resurfacing material that seems to be quite durable and quite low in carbon. So we're looking at pinching that if we can. Um, so we, we're constantly looking at new materials, but obviously the difficulty with looking at something new is you've got no history to it of how long it actually lasts. The stuff we're using all over when I came from Europe, it worked brilliantly in Europe, but there were less voids there because the tire, the requirement for tire grip is higher in Europe. So it comes down to it, you know, the real nitty gritty of how deep your tires are requires a change in the road specification, which leads to damage in different climate situations. So there's a lot of variables. Um, there we go. I can talk the highlights off a dog, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there for questions or for any further comments. I think it'd be very good, Bob, to be honest. Very interesting. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Jeff Jones first. 
Yeah, no, thanks, Bob, for the uh, report. I, I must admit, I, I think most councillors appreciate the the work that you actually do, and uh, you know the juggling act you actually got to carry out. Looking at the the figures you actually got here, you've got seventy million of backlog on carriageways. That doesn't include pavements. It's only the roads we're talking about there. Yeah, yeah, carriageways only. Yeah, uh, I said you know the figure is calculated every five years. You know, when was it last counted, and when is it next? due to be done, and I'm assuming that 70 million will actually go up. You've got figures actually in here as well about, you know, you would need seven to eight million a year to just maintain, shall we say. So that seven to eight million wouldn't actually go against the 70 million pound. You know, would it reduce it? And really, you know, what sort of budget figure have you actually got? No, have you got seven to eight million? OK, the seven to eight million figure is on carriageways. Mm -hmm. um, Last time we reported it, we tend to try and do the formal reporting. Sorry, I just turned it off. Um, the backlog figure um, tends to be calculated roughly at the start of the five year programme because it's when we're doing the assessment of all the streets, we get an updated condition of them all. Um, there's problems with the, the technical surveying systems can't do certain roads. If they've got speed car, um, traffic car in on the road, then the scanner uh, machine can't do an assessment because it has to go travel at a certain speed. It can't break and stop, it can't work on tight bends. It can't work on junctions. So there has to be a certain amount of visual inspection. This is done generally every five years. So it's probably a year or so before we recalculate. Sometimes we do um, give it an adjustment. Um, a couple of years ago, I was reporting five to six million on the steady state figure. The large increase there is down to not the deterioration of condition and if you look at the condition figures our, our network has remained roughly static it despite our figures of saying how much we need um over the last four or five years the percentages are roughly the same but we're um looking at material costings so the same scheme costing a lot more which pushes the backlog figure up in terms of the seven to eight million that's that's a calculation based on the condition of the road um the type of road the materials you use and the unit price of the materials looking at a deterioration curve. So obviously if the roads, more roads are in poor condition, the deterioration will be faster. It's, it's a very statistical model. I don't claim to understand it all, but it's been agreed nationally and we've, we've looked at it, we've all assessed it and it gives us a nice steady figure of comparison. If I was to get seven, eight million a year, honestly, I'd expect the backlog to come down um, because we are very, very good at making good decisions on preventative work. Um, in the recent years, my core figure for resurfacing is 600,000 a year. Um, my core figure for patch, which is all structural, is around 700 grand a year. So between the two, it's 1.3. That's my core figure. But I would say that every year for the last four or five, we've had additional money where we've gone back and said we need this. The first year of COVID, we took every penny we could get. We worked. Um, my resurfacing team normally manages a budget with the extra money we've had through our insurance um, funds, through Welsh Government grants. They normally work on about three million quid a year for carriageways. The first year of COVID, we just did just over nine million pounds worth of work. So we did three times the work we normally do in a year, all focused on the junctions and the areas that are difficult because obviously there were less people around. And we worked, did all of that, to my knowledge, without a single case of COVID being spread. They're all working outdoors and we understand it a little bit better now. But the, the, the contractors we had on board took every penny they could get and we did an, an awful lot of work. The next couple of years after that, monies have dropped a little bit, I think five million a year after. Um, this is the first year we haven't had a Welsh Government grant. Um, I see that as Welsh Government got all its money tied up within the 20 mile an hour scheme. So they're giving it back to us for different reasons on highways. Um, but actually, in terms of road maintenance grant, we haven't had anything from Welsh Government this year. Um, the, the, council, the council internally low have backed us. We had an additional 1.4 million for about five years for, from our commissioning reports. That has then been extended and we've got this year again, we were, we were given another 5 million over three years. And then when that still, we, we showed what we were doing with it, we've just been given another 3 million over the next three. So I know whenever money becomes available and there is money in the pot, we are given support to get extra money in when we can. And I always say we can spend whatever you give me, as long as it's you know not in February. Um, so we'll take anything we can. We have a very good list, as you say. 
if I'm given a million quid, I can tell you tomorrow if I if I just go down the list and it's just resurfacing, I can tell you which schemes we do. They're all priced up. Um, contractor will will turn them out. We are about a, three or four days per scheme on a, on a job, maybe a little longer if it's bigger. Um, so is the budget enough? Um, no, but can we manage the network with what we've got? Yes, and am I being supported financially? I believe so. Sum it up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So essentially, you, you you've got money, but not not as much as you'd like, and you need seven to eight. Be a bit short of that. I think that yeah, I'd always yeah. love to I'd love to have more. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say, in terms of the the name of the patch scheme, I know that does cause confusion because when I tell my residents such and such roads are being done to patch, they think it's like the pothole yeah. filling, and it might be useful to rename that to give it a better indication of what it actually. Yeah, doing. we're thinking something yeah. on the lines of small area resurfacing program. Yeah. Um, just patches stuck for years and it's people know, yeah. know what it is now and the councillors know what it is so yeah. But, yeah I think small area resurfacing program I think is something like that we're going for just what it says in the tin yeah and um, just on paragraph 4.5 you've got three main repair methods there um I know the pothole repair that you, you basically you you fill and go yeah um I'm not quite sure in, ter in terms of the other two but when, when you do a pothole repair, you don't tend to seal around the edges. No. So the, the conditions you've described of water penetration and, and that can, make, can leave, mean that that pothole has a much shorter life, it's life f f fill, has much shorter lifespan. I would argue, argue against that. Right. Um, the material we put in the pothole is very, very resilient. Right. What you're probably seeing is the further deterioration of the road around it. So if we right. pothole a road that is in poor condition, the pothole repair we've done surveys on this and when we went out for tender for the material we used we tested eight nine materials right the material we use has something like a 96 percent um success rate of permanency whereas most of the other products were in the region of 40 to 50 percent it is uh, it is i mean it's been bought out by tarmac the rights to produce this stuff has been bought out by one of the, the country's biggest Tarmac um, manufacturers. And in terms of the other two, -ish, the two types of hot bitumen and jet. Hot patch. bitumen is our general tarmac team, where we get a load of bitumen from a or asphalt concrete, as yeah. it's called now. We buy that from the quarry. We come out, we cut it out, we compact it, we do it in layers, and we've got a three-man tarmac gang there. Um, so that's my uh, my actual routine maintenance tarmac team. Uses hot material every day. Yeah. Is jet patching like the micro asphalt? Jet patching is a tanker that's got hot, um, a bitumen product inside it it's like a bitumen emulsion um it mixes with chippings and that's sprayed onto the road so it's so this, the micro asphalt type thing my, it's micro asphalt is a it's a slurry that's done over a large oh, area okay. and it's sort of spread yeah. with hand tools and it's sort of spread out i would say mm. if you think spray gun is the closest i can get for the jet patch but with aggregate in it and that does we tend to use that as a very good holding tool for instance where we were looking to do some work in future on Garrett under Pencliffe, we've used the jet patcher to fix the defects in the short term. Jet patcher is what we've been doing to plug all these surface defects um, because it's very, very good at doing that. It's been on the TV hundreds of times as a pothole repair tool, but we find it works very, very well on surface deterioration because there's no depth to it. Whereas everything else has got to yeah. have a, a reasonable depth to bind. This is just a spray motion, so it'll spray over the top. Um, it, it's, it's, it can be quite neat, not always, depending on how busy the junction is, because they try and get in and out. The biggest problem we have is splash. So we need a three man team because one guy's there just to hold the board to stop all the um, the, the neighboring cars and vehicles getting splashed from oh, the emotion yeah. as we do it. So, so where you have you described that fend, fend rather where they have a number of of the stuff that would be that you, you would use it there, for example. Tend to, yeah. And also where we've got um edge deterioration in rural roads where there's no drainage. It's not a permanent solution, but it is something that will hold for a couple of years. Yeah. We fill the channels very quickly, but it's not designed for that. And really we're accepting that we'll have to go back sooner than we'd like. Um, but it's an op option to fix. So we're looking at, let's say, it's that balance of knowing what we're doing is a little bit <coughs> wasted because we'll have to go back. But actually, it's all we can do to keep it going until we can get the money to do it properly. Yeah. So it's, it's our balancing scheme. OK, thanks, Bob. Cheers. Hi. Right, OK, there we are. Sorry about that. OK, so uh, the first, is that on now? Yeah, the first one is um, you got uh, Android uh, jet patcher jobs in the queue. 
Yeah. So um, how many uh, do you do in a week on average? Just for us to get an idea of how long a backlog is going to take. How long is a piece of string? That's the honest answer. If we send it to a road where there's three or four potholes, it'll be in and out within the hour. Um, if it, the road is like when we did um, Garrett into Penclave, that took us two days to do the, the length of the road. But it depends on how much we do in what area. Um, we generally use a full tanker load a day. So we fill it up in the morning with the bitumen emulsion and they'll work on it till it's gone. And that generally is a generally a work a full working day. There's very rarely they have enough time to fill it up twice. Um, how many how many potholes? Again, it's we don't tend to keep when we report on potholes, we don't include the jet patcher stuff because it might be doing 100 potholes in one hour because they're all little and they're all spaced over. So it's it's not something we include. It's difficult to prove statistically. Um, how many jobs typically? I don't know, three, four jobs a day, typically, different areas without home. And we try to keep it fairly close together so there's not too much traveling around. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, the other one, and you mentioned that um, uh, you've got the list there uh, yeah. of um, the roads that need to be doing. Yeah. Uh, and it's based on a point system. Yeah. Would you, uh, could you supply us with that list so we know what roads are on it? Uh, it we, we know then that if we, if we get any, uh, uh, anything on Facebook, let's say, and you know, we 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 sort of we can manage our residents' expectations. It's certainly possible to give you access to the list. I'll have to um, speak to my head of service, and we'll have to speak to people to see if that's a good idea. Partly because this list changes daily, um, it might be access to a link that we could put in to allow you to access to see what the current scoring is. But obviously, that doesn't explain why it's in there, what the score is. For, what we tends to happen is if you if you've got a particular road you're interested in if you email us saying we'll take the scores off the list we'll go and do a check on the road so we've got an up-to-date version because it might be the last score on the list was done three years ago so we tend to tend to do it via assessment steve williams who's an engineer just left us we used to give everything to him he would look at it reassess the road adjust the condition score and then send you back a detail to say this is where it stands this is what's above us. If I, I could have David, um, over the years, David, we've tried our best to stay away from members having the list because what happens is you may publish it and then the following day or the following week it changes and the residents come back and say to you, why isn't it being done? Now you told us when it was going to be done. The and better way is to get the officers to give you an update uh, at a particular time. So if you get a list, because it's a change in list, it's a it's a live document. You could be mem members of the public could be on to you saying, well, why is it changing? And then you've got a long explanation, and it could change many times in a, in a, in a couple of months. There's also the issue there with logistics because if say we were doing a particular type of work, only certain schemes are suited to that particular treatment. So we'll pick the the top scheme. And then we'll look down the list to see which other schemes can be done with the same product in the same vicinity. So although this the the, the the scoring is based on risk, it may be we'll jump through the scoring depending on what the type of work is. Uh, if, for instance, we were doing something with fibre reinforced tarmac, which we tend to use over concrete roads, then obviously we're only going to pick from those. And we've got to use a certain amount of money to get the contractors in. They might want a minimum of 200 grand before they'll even come to see us, in which case we've got to look at those type of schemes. So there's a, there's a lot of detail to why um, the list is great and it gives us a really good answer in terms of general condition, but it's not the everything in terms of which what we do in what order. I can't just say that we just take it from the top and work down. It might be that there's a development site or something and we don't want to resurface the road because the development site is going to just trash it and we'll leave that and put that back. So there's, there's lots of interferences. Um, I don't have an issue with it personally. You see in the list of what the scores are and what the value is. Um, but I think it's something we need to, I will have to talk back and give you a, a proper answer on it. OK, thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Thanks very much for okay. the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, I Oh, oh, sorry. Thanks, Pete. 
Um, you mentioned single roads going into villages. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got two very narrow pieces. Yeah, the lanes, road. Through, the lanes up to Panard, for instance. Yep, the narrows, badly in need of um, more work, and the area on the airport road going around Kilbury Manor. I mean, the pothole team come in. Oh, and, uh, the airport road around Kilbury Manor, that wouldn't be um, single road, would it? There's, there are detours. It's, you very, can take it's very narrow in part. But there's diversions you can take, isn't there? Mm, as a push. Yeah. Okay. So when I'm, I'm thinking of like the road, I mean, if you pass Fenaway Lane and you go into Panard, yeah. through the narrows there, you haven't got an alternative view. So that would all be the road well, I was just through the narrows would get extra points because it is a single access. Yeah. So how do you get around that? Because it means a road closure. Oh, it does. Um, there are, when we do those works with a road closure, we will, the traffic management is very complicated. We, we'll do it all under lights. So we'd have to let people through. That means that we have to be selective in the type of treatments we use. We couldn't use hot rod asphalt, for instance, which is our, our best mm. surface in material, because we'd have to close the road per- permanently. It might be that we'd um, phase the works and sort of warn everybody, but then there would still be um, access maintained for the emergency services. At the end of the day, you're digging the road up so they can drive over rough surfaces if it comes to it. Each situation is done um, on its own merit. I mean, we've we've surfaced those lanes before. Um, mm. I would imagine those would be done under traffic light control, and we would oh, do. Have to be. But you, yeah. would you do it overnight or? Not those. Generally, overnight works is where there's massive flow on the network. So I would suspect they'd be done daytimes, um, but it would be done under traffic light control, and we'd have to do half one day, half the next. And this is where you get the the joints forming in the middle. So you'll all see the roads where you've got that little joint down the mm-hmm. middle. That's the, the the key point of deterioration for us. But sometimes you can't avoid it because of the, the logistics. Take take the Kingsway, for instance, right? The Kingsway has been narrowed as part of the, the regeneration. Yeah. Great road. That road is now not uh, wide enough for me to work on one lane. So when I do work on the Kingsway, I have to hold, close the whole thing. So there is, but but there are diversions there. And, you know, there's, there's, in there's methods of doing... Uh, in mm-hmm. <laughs> now I, I feel sorry for the pothole team that come in they, it must be a risk for them it is the the, the, the beauty and of, kill for, for as well that will speed the way people yeah, come i mean we've got we have vehicles we've got a mobile crash cushion for instance so if it is a risky area this cushion will park at the back of the works and if anybody hits it they the, the cushion won't move and there's a lot of there's a cushion on the back so it will minimize the impact mm-hmm. uh, in, impact protection vehicle it's, it's called we use that in the gower a lot when we're doing work on bends and stuff. So there's there's formal methods and procedures for looking at traffic management that we have to comply to. Um, I would say that the pothole material we use, one of the reasons the pothole initiative work, and it's the only reason it works, and I say we were asked by the Department of Transport to go and talk about our pothole initiative, because to my knowledge, we're the only council anywhere in the country that have a pothole promise to fix stuff without checking it. And it's only possible because the material doesn't need to be cut out. It can be used in the wet. Actually, we need to put water in there to activate it. And it is extremely resilient. It doesn't need compacting. So the repair times are minimal. Mm -hmm. So we can get in and out. And that's the safety. Actually, we can stop the traffic with a vehicle, do the repair in like two, three minutes, and then we're on to the next one. The biggest delay between repairs tends to be the travelling time. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Right, you mentioned that uh, at Black Pearl, this the surface deteriorated in, in, in a week. Mm-hmm. Um, is that because of flooding? No, that was because of the freezing action between um, over the Christmas period. Right. I'm, my in-laws live in Pernard and I drive up that way quite a lot over the week. And the start of the week, there was nothing. And on the way back home, um, it had gone. The, the, the surface in layers there, uh, the top layer is 40 mil thick and it's this... Um, uh, it's, it's called an SMA, stone mastic asphalt. It's a type of surface and material that's got a lot of void in it. The water gets in where there was flooding, water gets into it, and then when it freezes, obviously the, it the it's yeah, it's pre-store action, same as you did in your geology low levels years ago. Yeah. It'll it, it basically it's just true, freezes yeah. and it busts it out. Um there is an issue with flooding there. Part of the problem with that was um the fact that it's tidal. And all the fl- all the all the outlets and all the drains that lead out to the beach when the tide's high, they've got nowhere to go. Um, so we are looking at how to give a sort of temporary holding situation there to take the water off the road to stop it happening again. Because but 
in the meantime, we're going to have to resurface it um, as is. OK, thanks. Anyone online want to ask any questions? No? Stuart, would you like to make any comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, I, I mean, you covered the prioritisation issue. I, I, I just add to that, really. Um, that sharing the list is sometimes uh, the expectation is that, that that scheme will then be done and will happen very soon. But you know, as you've covered it, the risk is is that the the prioritisation is a sort of point in time, um, and that very much can change. So, um, so I, I I think we just need to be cautious about that kind of raising expectation in terms of that. It's not about being secretive, but it's just about emphasising the information we share can change, and uh, it's the point in time. Um, I, I think Bob's covered a, a lot of the detail, um, you know, very well in terms of on there. I think um, the the one positive we've had in terms of from a highway perspective is the commissioning review, which was carried out a few years ago. I kind of lose track of time, but I think it was about five or six years ago. Um, at that point, we um, had to look at all the service areas, I guess, in the council. But from a highway's perspective, it was talking about the kind of investment needed, the road condition, and and since that point, there has been, you know, certainly, you know, more investment going in in terms of from. Um, you know, in terms of highway additional capital funding, um, but uh, with the, with the nature of the the type of backlog and things, you know, more funding is always always needed and always welcomed. And uh, and the level of deterioration, as uh, as Bob talks about, it can be very rapid over the winter period. Um, I guess everyone thinks, oh, when it's extremely cold, then that's the worst for it. But but it isn't. Bob's talked very much. It's about that kind of the moderate where you've got continuous freeze thaw cycles happening that's when you get the the greatest level of deterioration and where uh, that's when your you, your plans for what you think you were going to be spending highway maintenance uh, funding and prioritization on can sometimes have to be uh, changed quite radically following a, a a challenging winter so um so yeah there would be the only thing certainly to, to make so thank you chair thank you sir councillor matthew jones Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Bert, um, and thank you, Bob. I could listen to Bob for hours. I got to be honest. I think it's it's, it's great, and obviously, it's a extremely high uh, hot topic with regards to um, residents. But it's it's really comforting, I think, to hear that we've got so many um, sort of good structures in place um, and uh, plans and 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 ongoing plans as well to deal with to deal with th things like that. Um, and you know when when people you know report stuff to me and, and I, I have a, a, a good fairly good knowledge of, of highways and how they work um, in my day to day job, um, I'm able to maybe explain a little bit better what's you know what's um, what is a defect and what isn't a defect then, um, and I think people's perception of what a defect is in the road. Um, <laughs> It's it's not what the criteria fits the criteria as well, um, and as and as Bob said, I think it's really important um, to to mention as well that Swansea isn't the only authority suffering. You know, it's authorities all over Wales and England that are suffering with the roads as well, and there'll never be enough money to go around, unfortunately, to fix these. But you know, I would like to pay tribute to the portal uh, repair team and to the resurfacing guys as well and girls. Um, because I think they do an absolutely fantastic job in difficult conditions under extreme pressure. So, you know, all credit to the highways team um, and the resurfacing teams. I think they do a fantastic job, as I said, and um, long may it continue. Anyone else? No? Oh, sorry, Jeff. It's, uh, I'm just trying to clarify in my mind, you know, I, I'm not knocking Swansea. I think they do, you know, a marvelous job. You know, the team and so on. But some areas, I, I'm talking perhaps like Breckenshire and perhaps even Carmarthenshire, the roads seem to be in a, a better state of repair. Um, you know, when we apply, I assume we apply for monies from the Welsh government. What sort of things do they actually take into account? You know, we. We've got, uh, you know, Cardiff City, Swansea City, and so on. Um, perhaps Carmarthen's not. I'm not trying to knock Carmarthen, but is there some sort of 
method that they actually calculate that Swansea should have perhaps more because of certain things and you know uh, and, and do we get do we get more you know do you want to answer that Stuart or do I, I mean for my understanding of that is when Welsh government allocate a pot of money there's a standing split there's they've got a percentage split between each authority um and we get x times b a times b equals c um that's how much we get for it is can i help grade. we in the uh in the distribution formula there is a formula for roads uh length of roads etc also on the trunk roads uh, motorways airbeads and what have you and there's also an urban urban rural split and percentage of use to the road it, it it's a bit of a dark art if i'm perfectly honest uh i don't think i think if you had the head of finance here and asked him about it i think he would tell you the same it is a bit difficult because of the way the distribution formula works out but generally speaking urban areas get a sum of money more than rural areas but you have to remember the traffic usage, traffic usage on many rural roads is so limited that you don't see the deterioration that you do on urban roads. No, I was going to say I once attended this um, distribution subgroup, and uh, yeah. yes, that was very, I mean, experience to say, to say the least. Um, the, the the funding formula for local authority in terms of revenue is based on the number of miles of trunk roads and and, and urban roads. So. If you've got a lot of roads and you get more money, if you have less fewer roads, you get less money. In terms of the special grants, they tend to distribute that by on population. Yeah, I, I would say that we've yeah. got a very similar network size to Cardiff, um, but Cardiff tend to get much more money, um, and because of population, I would assume. It, it, it's actually yeah. it's it's usage as well. It's the the number of usage of a particular road. Now, if you take, I don't know. If you take Ely, the Ely bypass in Cardiff, I'm not sure that's got a higher usage than, say, Mumbles Road. I would very, very much doubt it. So, but it's the percentage of those roads that get the usage, and that and that is the argument that they would use in Cardiff to have more. I'm not arguing against it. It's, it's more people, more cars, more use, and it is the wear and tear. Um, I, th I think there's, there's one point I did miss. I would like to raise, if possible, is one of our challenges, and this relates to traffic calming. Is something for me that I raise on a regular basis. Um, traffic calming destroys roads. Um, I know it's needed for safety and we have to have it. I would take a 50% lifespan reduction on a road if you put um, a speed cushion in it. And that's something that's caused us a massive problem over the years because of the increase in traffic. And it might be one of the small benefits to the, the 20 mile an hour scheme if the amount of traffic calming reduces. What in terms of the tarmac humps, does that have the same impact? Um, it's the braking forces before and after. Yeah. Okay. So if you if you see a, um, a traffic calming in the road, you slow down and you you brake more, particularly when you've got buses or heavy vehicles or Tesco's delivery lorries. Um, the brake. Yeah. That's it. The braking forces before the hump and acceleration forces after. Um, if you look at and on a lot of roads, you you see down where there's traffic calming, you'll see all the deterioration is just before and after yeah. the, the speed humps. Oh, yeah, you know, um, okay. Anyone else? Sorry, Councillor Lock. OK, um, in the Daily Mail this week, I know the Daily Mail is perhaps most accurate, but they said that the electric cars are heavier and they will be causing more wear and tear. We'll see, but <laughs> um, it's a, it is a concern. The electric vehicles are heavier and they tend to accelerate, decelerate. They've got very good brakes on them. Um, so it would be an interesting point to see how that happens. OK. Um, yeah, watch the space for that. I think I'd, I'd agree with that. I think the, the amount of talk in terms of uh, low speed that electric cars have put now in addition to the weight, it uh, will become there'll be more tearing forces in terms of on the road. So it, it, it certainly wouldn't surprise us if we see uh, kind of an increase in the level of uh, deterioration from them. I know there's a problem about multi-storey car parks because the additional weight. I didn't know there was. Um, OK, uh, I, I've got a few questions. Um, I think the first question is one that was brought up some time ago, and that's the definition of what potholes and what have you and, and how you classify them. Has that changed in the last couple of years or has that been constant? 
um, there's an all all Wales intervention level in, in, in a general rule of thumb on a carriageway, a pothole to be a statutory safety defect would have to be more than two inches deep. So more than 50 mil deep. Within each council's safety policy, then there will be a definition of a minimum size. You, you, we don't want to be looking at a 50 mil deep pothole that's only two inches wide because um, there's no threat to anyone. So I think in ours, it's, it's something like 100 mil in one direction. We have to be careful then because obviously when you look at bicycles, motorbikes, etc., a, a 50 mil wide defect that's two inches deep but actually goes over 200 mil in length can be really nasty to a bicycle. So there's there's judgment on it. But in general, if, um, two inches deep is what we're looking on on the carriageways. There has been some change on that overall because we've got a new um, uh, guidance note on code of best practice, which splits roads up into different categories where we used to have fairly simple wording for like a main road, a strategic route, a linked road. They've all got categorization letters now, and there are slightly different intervention levels over those to take account of things like rear lanes because a rear lane would have the same intervention level as the lane in front of the house. And yeah, if you look at the a lot of the rear lanes and the terraced areas of Swansea, some of those, if I did a strict safety inspection on those, some of those would fail badly every time, um, but they're still adopted. So that there was a review of the policy nationally, um, but in general, two inches on the on the carriageway, um, an inch on the footway. So the two inches plus inch. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest issues, especially I, I wouldn't, I would have thought in the rural areas, is water across the roads, uh, flooding from some fields and what have you. Now it is the, the moment at the moment it is the landowner's responsibility to stop the water coming across the road and damaging the highway. Have we been successful in 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 actually curing that problem? I, I don't think we'll ever cure the problem. No. But there are so many examples where we have dealt with landowners and stopped the water. It tends we we have a, a right to discharge on the private land, but it gets a bit legal then whether there's compensation involved. There's there's lots of historic drainage that goes into farmers' lands in the Gower. Um, there are sinkholes and there are soakaways in farmers' lands. You get examples then where water comes off the road, and a difficult example would be the one near Periswood, where there was water coming off the land, but actually it's not been directed so it's it tends to be where water has been directed on the highway we can take an enforcement action so if somebody puts a um, a pipe out from the side of their garden and it puts water onto the road then that we can do enforcement on if it's general seepage through a bank very very difficult to enforce um it tends to be working with the person then to try and solve the problem and that and that's the same where you have old colliery workings that seep through um permit rock what have you then come down in that so that's the same as it yeah and if you and another good example there would be the hill going out through calais where we sometimes have orange water coming onto the road mm. now it's very difficult to enforce on anyone there because that water is coming from underground from many many different places so it tends to be enough we try and pick it up where it comes out onto the highway rather than taking enforcement action it's it's again it's all balance it's a very difficult situation each time um, and we'll never stop it, but um, you know you have to look at each individual situation and, and deal with it sensibly. Uh, um, two two questions, which one is statutory undertakers, which are a nightmare. Um, you know, obviously we have a problem, and if you go back to the days when they laid cable tail and the pavements were a disaster. Um, what have there been any changes in the law with statutory undertakers, especially? Considering when they I'll give an example, when they put the gas main at Camarthen Road, uh, I, I can't remember ever seeing such an operation as that, where they had the concrete and then put tarmac on. Is has there been changes in it? No major changes. It's it's a we work tend to work well with most of the statutory undertakers. Um, we do have issues with a couple, but it's um, there are there's a whole. Act of Parliament, New Roads and Street Works Act that deals with how this works. Um, generally, we will get reasonable compliance with it. We have, um, this is one of the reasons we said we don't like the list going out because before we, even when we've decided what works we're going to do, we then have to have a meeting with all the statutory undertakers to find out if they've got works planned. Um, I've, the road outside my house was relayed 
and then dug up three days later and off I went ballistic because obviously it's a major issue for me and it was right in front of where I was living and I was told it was a new connection um, and challenging that even though the house had been up for 100 years was I was advised it was impossible even though they'd obviously had a connection previously um, so there's difficulties but we tend to work with them rather than against them um, we've got some very good relations on one side with Welsh water operations um, we work well well with Wales and West Wales and West is a difficult one again because of gas and people often see roadworks with nothing happening when that tends to be venting and obviously you don't want to be doing work, work in a hole where there's, there's a, you know gas has been detected so there's lots of issues with that the biggest issue I've got with statutory undertakers is not advertising who they are we've asked them we've told them we go around we put our own signs on there their things but if, if it's clear that it's Welsh, Welsh water or Western power or Wales and West then they tend to get it in the neck straight away rather than it coming through us and the council getting blamed for everything so that that would be a, the biggest issue I've got with them but it's nothing statutory that we can force so it's working with them okay Stuart do you want to come in on this yeah just to reiterate as well it, you know it certainly has been a, a challenge it does reduce the life expectancy of a road in terms of once you have utility trenches running through um, never quite get the same kind of uh, finish and, and levels of compaction you get uh, more settlement we we do um, employ a company who carries out coring in terms of following on and, and uh, to to check how good the reinstatements are um, and that's a program and we can go back at utility companies for quite a period afterwards in terms of on there and that's that's something that it's not just about getting the reinstatement sort of redone it's about getting the message across to some of the utilities that they really need to focus on putting high quality reinstatements in so hopefully it's a it's both a short-term solution and a, a something that will kind of drive up the standard over a longer period of time so uh, um, it's a program we're, we're keen on in terms of on there so thank you well good luck with that Stuart uh Councillor Matty Jones uh, Stuart must have some sort of crystal box. He just um, he just answered the exact sort of query I was going to um, uh, ask. To be honest, chairs about you know checking out checking up on the utility companies um, to make sure they're doing quality work and and then getting them back if we do get engaged. But uh, no, Stuart's uh, covered that. Thank you very much. Hey, Councillor Peter Bullard. Yeah, having lived through the cable tell. Um, issue we've been we, we are facing i think um, fiber optic uh, cable laying aren't we at some stage um and i'm just wondering uh, you know if we've got a handle on that and, and and making sure that the companies many of whom will not be our regular statutory undertakers are, are sort of up to speed on what needs to be done yeah we we've, we've got a very standard process for it we look at everything the biggest trouble we tend to get is with the bigger companies doing a rollout nationally for some corporate or national agenda then we'll try and exempt themselves from the normal process and say, look, can we just have sign up for the whole of this program, please? And of course, that gets a lot of political backing nationally because they want to get these um, big schemes out. And we're very stubborn with that and say no. And this is, again, where good networking across Wales is essential because all the um, our, our streetworks manager, Dean, he is the chair of the Welsh Hawk, which is the highway authority and utility companies meetings. So he chairs that and he represents Wales and um, down in London. So we've got somebody who's really, really sharp on um, what the rules are and what we can do. And it's very, very important in networking and those meetings where all the authorities meet with all the undertakers, very, very useful. But yeah, it, it's it's there. Little companies can cause us problems, but we tend to deal with those fairly well. I personally think. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, sorry, Linda. Do you have any um, dealings with builders? Because when I walk around the villages and, and on the pavements, wherever the pavement's broken up, it's outside a house that's had a lot of extension, extensive building work. Um, I've challenged a few of the builders when their delivery lorries have left these great big holes, round holes in the pavements and insisted they repair them. But generally, the pavements are broken up only where um, there's been building works done. Are you able to challenge the builders? In terms of pavements, um, a lot of damage is caused by vehicle parking, whether it's residents, whether it's delivery companies. And bearing in mind the amount of deliveries that happen nowadays that never used to. So people get their um, shopping delivered at home. Those are 
medium goods vehicles, Amazon delivery vehicles. You know, it, it, it goes on. A lot more vehicles are parking and driving on the pavement with builders, particularly um, heavy vehicles. Obviously, the building vehicles tend to be a much higher wheel load. It does cause issues. What we need is witness statements of the actual damage happening. And that is really difficult because they will say it was crap before I got there and you can't prove it. Um, we do reasonably well on the big developments where we do condition surveys before and after. So if we knew, for instance, even our own developments where we're doing the more homes policies, we always do an assessment and a survey of the sites around the site beforehand. And if we note deterioration on the road due to a major development, um, again, Steve, who's just left, he was brilliant. He had, I think he had £40,000 out of Swansea University for the Bay Campus when they strayed into Swansea. Um, so it is something we do pick up and it, it's something we've got a training new officer in dealing with. Um, smaller developments are much more difficult. Um, it, again, it's proving it. Um, and where, especially where there's no 278 works in place. So if it's a development that's got liaison with the council over highway changes, their team will look at the damage done and that, that's much easier to control if it's a small development or a small bit of building work or somebody having builders on their, um, their house. We don't even know it goes on most of the time. So very, very, very difficult. Um, and we're, sort of, we're always keen. Verge damage again, very similar. Um, and we have been successful a number of times, but it's basically catching them in sight where you can see the vehicles are actually sitting in a, um, a rut on the road or there's you know, actual paving slab damage done. Um, so frustrating and not something we specifically target, but we do react to and we'll try and deal with as we can. Uh, I've got a couple more questions, that's all. Um, the, the, the first one actually, this is probably Stuart to answer. Uh, you said you have capital monies, monies to do the road repair, uh, resurfacing and what have you. Um, so what is your revenue account? Uh, what is the revenue amount you have per year and how much capital have you have? Well, not specifically this year, but is there a capital sum? Because obviously you've got to buy materials. The revenue is actually the, the wages, etc. But is, is that split easily defined or is it just all a, a global sum? Um, I mean, I'll start. Um, Bob will probably have uh, kind of more familiarity with the actual uh, funding levels, but with his, uh, there's a revenue allocation which enables us in terms of uh, funding the workforce and, uh, and the more sort of routine activities, pothole repairs, etc. The the kind of is is carried out from uh, from revenue funding, and then the capital funding is a separate pot, which there's a there's I guess a base allocation, and then on top of that, um, there's a a kind of additional funding is is often provided um, in year from both uh, the council itself and then uh, uh, hopefully when Welsh Government grants or additional support or anything comes through. Um, so they're two sort of separate streams of funding and uh, so the routine is more about the responsive which would be revenue while the capital is about more of the, the planned activity so um, but Bob may have uh, some, some more to add into that. Uh, yeah I, I wouldn't I say I wouldn't quote me on the figures, but from top of the head, um, our capital allocation normally, where I said the, the core allocation of uh, carriageways is 600 grand, our actual core allocation is 3.6 million, but that gets split between carriageways, roads, public lighting, footpaths, drainage, coastal defence, active travel, traffic lights, etc. So that's that's your typical core allocation. Revenue wise, it's we have a routine repairs budget. Um, I believe it's around the 1.4 million mark, but I, yeah, I can, it is, it is split between routine repairs, structural repairs, even like we have a fencing budget, a safety fencing budget. Um, I've merged the drainage and water course budgets recently because they were split in different ways when actually it's all water related. We are doing some work to put those together, but yes, the, 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 the revenue budget has seen small improvements over the years but small, it's effectively static um, and we just do with what we can, but that does include material costs. So obviously where we're doing resurfacing, the amount of money that costs has gone up. Um, we've, I say we've not been fortunate, but we've balanced it recently because we've had a number of losses of staff and we've had found difficulty replacing them because of 
you just haven't got people interested in doing the work for the money we can offer and that has reduced the amount of work we've done therefore i've been keeping my budgets intact but i can i can get certainly give you the figures we i believe most of the figures are actually on the, the on the web we have a frequency asked questions page from highways we get quite a lot of um foi requests on um funding revenue funding and most i don't think i've done this year's but most previous years information is on the web i believe The final question, it's not a question actually, it's just a statement really. Um, in 6.4, highway maintenance has been reviewed as, by the scrutiny programme as follows. The reason for that, I think, and I, to, to steer it on you, Bob, is the fact that of all the services the council do, highways and uh, the, the, the highways and, and, and footpaths are used by every single person in this city and visitors. So the the reality is, you know, you've got a quarter of a million plus people who, are, who ask local councillors what's happening to our roads. So I think the effect on the, the fact that we scrutinise it more is because, you know, not everybody uses social services, not everybody uses education, but everybody walks on the pavements on the roads. And that's why, in all honesty, you are scrutinised so much. And uh, I have to say, you've done a really good job today. I, I, oh, thank you for that comment. Um, we put this in on there was one time we were asked, went to scrutiny within six months a couple of times. We managed to turn, avoid going once because we actually showed that we'd been recently. So it's just a list for me that keeps it in mind of, of when we've gone. And actually, it's very useful because it, it does give you a chance to redo what you do and you update your, your facts, update your figures and you look at things. Um, and it, it, it's a... a compaction of knowledge i suppose to put it back into a report this one was rewritten from scratch because the last one i had was a little bit wrong in different places and you have to update things so um it is very useful I've just been asked to go to a i can't remember which committee is but there's another one in about six months now for something similar but i've been told that's not scrutiny so it's something different but same subject so it's useful having these things but thank you for your comments okay the final thing is it do you call uh, you cover active travel? I assume that's maintenance, is it? Not the building of our wonderful shared pavements. Um, active travel comes under the the construction of the active travel network is under a different team. Yes, I do cover the maintenance of them, um, and there are ongoing discussions of what that maintenance is because, as it's Welsh government funded, there tends to be no maintenance money comes with it. And we've got something like 25 million over the last five or six years, um, even if you look at litter picking and which I don't, which is comes to cleansing and the cutback of um, vegetation around the sides of these paths is quite a considerable amount. So it's, it's, it's ongoing discussions and we're looking to try and work out what a fair rate is to ask for um, to maintain these things going forward because we don't want them to be overrun. Okay, thank you. I think Chair, maybe we should ask our representative on the distribution subgroup to include the number of miles of active travel routes into the funding formula. I think that may be a very, very good idea. Okay, if if that's everyone. Oh, sorry. Oh, Stuart. Yeah, ju just to add, yeah, ju just to add to that in terms of active travel. Um, quite often the, the routes do require, I guess, slightly more tricky. The, some of them are off highway that require sort of slightly more expensive, slightly more tricky sort of treatment. So it is something that we we have raised in terms of from a Welsh government perspective to ensure that it's it's not just getting the capital allocation for putting them in, but to um, to make sure that we raise that it's about getting sort of uh, appropriate funding for the ongoing maintenance. Really, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Can, and if that's all. Can I thank you, Stuart, and especially you, Bob, you've been incredibly good at, at highlighting all the different facts that we've asked, and you've had a considerable amount of questions, more than I think we've had in many scrutiny boards, and thank you very much for your very, very good answers, and thank you, Stuart. Thanks for the support, that's all I can say. I, 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 thank you. On the agenda are letters. Uh, I don't... I think we've done, I think you've had uh, copies of them. Right. Uh, and before uh, that, the scrutiny programme committee are meeting next week and discussion will be taking place on a su next. Pardon? Week, after. week after next. Sorry. Um, the suggestion that is being put forward is that this finance and, and uh, performance scrutiny improvement and uh, finance panel merges with development and regen. Uh, mainly because of the 
workloads on both of these is, is, is very, very similar now. And the thought is that we merge the both of them and actually give it more headroom uh, for some further work within the scrutiny function. Uh, so just to let you know, this is the, the, the last meeting of the current service improvement and finance panel. There will be one further meeting of the regen panel, which will take place next. Is it next month? Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you all very much. And uh, I hope it's dry when we go out. <laughs> thank you.